when you were maybe nine? Yes. I, I remember I couldn't wait to turn 10. And he kept telling me I was my mom and kept trying to do stuff to me. And I fought, yeah. And then he got mad because I like fought and I broke his nail and he always kept his nails really, really, really long. And he got mad and he started hitting me and hitting me and then he took off my clothes and proceeded to, he took my virginity. <laughs> the stuff that happened during the civil rights movement, whether you're talking about the Selma march or you're talking about the children march, all things that were, if not initiated by Jim Bevel, he was very instrumental in, in terms of getting them started. And it's very interesting listening to the comments or, or the quotes from other people in the civil rights movement. Their quotes about him are very interesting. And that is the lighter side. Uh, absolute standout. You were aware that this was a, a guy full of kinetic energy and uh, electricity, a very odd and elliptical way of speaking, mixing biblical language with street. But then there's the dark side. Uh, and to put it bluntly, here's a man who when his relationship to the SCLC was severed in 1969 for the next 35 years, was basically a, uh, a uh, unrepentant pedophile. I was, of course, dismayed when news releases broke about incest by James Bevel. What crossed my mind was that Bevel's personality, as, as I had encountered it, however briefly, uh, had the, the uh, mesmerizing quality that I, I've actually seen in cult leaders. Uh, and it made me think about uh, the relation of sexuality and uh, political power. It would be his actions, whether he would climb on my back and, and, and grind or um, wake up with him, him um, just, just licking my vagina or just touching me or something. I just wake up from his actions. Blacks and Latinos say that we don't sexually abuse our children. Oh, okay. Well, I'm black and I've been sexually abused and we do abuse our children. What we don't do is we don't, um, we don't let it come outside of that home. I think that we have dealt with it differently because we have a historically a different um, perspective about intervention of law enforcement in our lives. And black victims of crimes have been, there's always been a disparity with how law enforcement and the district attorney's office have treated them and perceived their credibility and perceived um, how we want to deal with it. And so with that in mind, the black community, we have taken care of it within our own community by either ostracizing um, the individuals, trying to keep them away from our children, and dealing with it on our own. We need to start talking about it. Our children are dying because we're not talking about it. Too many of us do not, because there's a stigma with saying that, and yet we know as um, the late great director Marlon Riggs has said, 
you know, talking is a cure for what ails us. So if we are not able to talk about it, how can we fix it? Stop denying that it happens. Stop denying that it happens in your churches, in your mosques, in your temples, in your, in your, congreg uh, in your congregation. Stop denying that it happens. I remember telling my mother, you know, that this was happening. And I remember them sending me to a psychiatrist on base because I was a liar. So they had me going to a psychiatrist to find out why I was a liar. Is it enough that we've already been treated like an animal, been molested and violated? Isn't that enough? And then we have to deal with your freaking crapping judgments about I'm crazy or I'm mental or I'm emotional. Well, hell yes, I'm emotional. Would you be emotional if somebody had done all these things to you and violated your body? And then, so you have, it's like a double whammy. You got to deal with that and then the, sh the shame of all of that. I dare you, how dare you judge me because of something that happened to me that I had no control over. <laughs> I wrote my mom letters all the time. I would write her little letters and leave them in her purse or under her pillow or in her shoe. It was always little letters like, I love you. And um, tomorrow is, you know, such and such. Or I got this, you know, just little things I would write her. So that clicked to me because that, that was a form of communications that I enjoyed doing. And so I wrote her a letter and I, I believe I just put it on her bed on top of her pillow. And um, when she, she saw it, she called me to her and she said, you know, she called me and I came. And she said, um, um, and she probably said something like, I, I got your letter, or she had it in her hand or something. And she said, you spelled molest wrong. There is a huge misconception that this abuse only happens to females. And it's my opinion that it's because you're talking about sex. And most oftentimes, people think of sex between a male and a female or a man and a woman and to really start delving into the abuse against a child even if it is a female there are so many young boys who are being sexually abused as well it was penetration fondling oral sex you know she did what she thought she could do I remember when I was probably no more than four years old, and I had a 16-year-old sister who used to take me to bed with her at night and, you know, end up, uh, you know, having me put my penis inside of her and all of that. Uh, and as far as I know, and as, you know, in terms of talking with other brothers and sisters, Jim also w was sexually molested. If I was a perpetrator, one of the things I would know, one of the things that would be likely is that I would be hoping to eventually be caught. Um, and, and in the forensic work that I do with Bob, we hear this a lot of times, that there are people who commit an array of crimes who are relieved when they get caught. What does that tell you? What does that tell you? My feeling is what we need to do is be able to articulate our compassion as people in terms of this punitive vengeance thing that the criminal justice system does have. You know, we, we make them out as monsters, as something non-human. You know, they're not. And one of the things I learn are, is the systemic way. There's actually a process by which our communities make monsters. We make monsters, we make en enemies. They're homegrown. And, and you begin to see how that occurs when you sit down and engage these people. And that's extremely useful information if we are at all serious about making our communities safer and making our communities places for healing and making sure that we uh, hear people when they do try to report, when they do try to tell us. Listening to those people talk, listening to their story, listening to what happened to them, listening to the rationale, why they did what they did, you know, their journey. You can hear how we create them, we make them. The need to subjugate someone else, to put them down, whether it's verbally or sexually, that has to come from somewhere. And unless you understand that, you're going to continue that pattern. If I am going to be true to myself and be authentic with me, there's an element of forgiveness that I 
that I choose to deliver to someone who has done one of the most vilest things that I can possibly imagine and understand that my God and my divine gives me the power of forgiveness. Who will speak for the children? Well, I think it's got to be people like me. I'm going to speak for the children. You're going to speak for the children. People like us don't talk about it. You know, who will? I mean, and who can these kids look up to? The children need to learn how to speak for themselves as well. You have to speak for yourself. It's hard, but you, you got to do it. If you hold it in and you keep it to yourself, it's nothing but more pain. And it causes you to do really stupid stuff. They need to take that negative thing and turn it around and use it as a launching pad for far greater things. Looking back at my own experience of incest, there was never an opportunity to speak to what was happening to me. And I had a lot to say. There's someone who will listen to you. I will listen to you. And there's someone who will believe you. I believe you. Shame is an admission to ourselves of our potential. Loneliness ain't nothing but the stranger that's inside.